on this episode of Old Joe's Reminiscence. The third time wasn't a charm when the ABC network attempted yet another pilot film based on Gene Roddenberry's Bahama vacation idea. CBS had certainly let Gene Roddenberry down when they'd taken Planet of the Apes over Gene's Genesis 2, and ABC had passed on his retooled Planet Earth. Did he dare go crawling to NBC? Remember, he and the Peacock had butted heads during the production of Star Trek. I mentioned in my last review that ABC needed films to fuel their weekly schedule, which was airing movies five nights a week by the summer of 1975. ABC ordered another pilot. This time, PAX was going to journey around the sun. It's unclear at this point if ABC decided to kick Gene Roddenberry to the curb or if he decided to take a hike. Either way, he was no longer involved. Now, I've read that it's a lot more serious in theme this time. Director Robert Butler was brought on board. He had worked on scores of television shows, including two episodes of Star Trek. He had previously directed several made-for-TV films as well. John Saxon is back. But to avoid litigation, the ABC Suits had decided to change the Dylan Hunt character name. For this outing, which aired on Sunday, July 13, 1975, he's now PAX leader Captain Anthony Vico. So take a look if you don't enjoy spoilers, because I'm going to get out my spyglass and analyze the ABC Sunday Night Movie presentation of... Strange New World. The ABC Sunday Night Movie. We begin with a title sequence featuring what appears to be a space station in Earth's orbit. John Saxon explains in a voiceover that this is the PAX Space Laboratory. Now, anyone who's a lifelong Star Trek fan, like myself, will instantly recognize the first sound we hear. It's the one they used at Mr. Spock's science station aboard the USS Enterprise. They even included the whoosh of the turbo lift door opening. If they're in suspended animation, who's opening the doors? I think that's a very odd sound effect choice to make there. John Saxon introduces himself and his crew. That's me, Captain Anthony Vico. I went from test pilot to astronaut, and now I'm leader of the PAX team. John Saxon was born Carmine Orico in Brooklyn, New York on August 5, 1936. As a teen, he was coming out of a movie theater when a modeling agent spotted him. Then a talent scout saw his picture in a magazine and took him to Hollywood. He started appearing on the big screen at the age of 18 in 1954. His career included more than 200 film and television appearances until 2017. John Saxon died on July 25, 2020. Alison Crowley, navigator and communications expert. Dr. Crowley is played by Kathleen Miller. Kathleen Miller, born July 1, 1945, was the daughter of an actress and a Paramount Pictures executive. She appeared briefly on Broadway before coming home to L.A. to act on screen. She played Anya Nett in the 1975 Smash Shampoo. Kathleen later played public defender Gail Goodman in 13 episodes of the 1976 series Sorota's Court. Kathleen Miller died on October 7, 2016. Facts Dr. William Scott. Dr. Scott is played by Keen Curtis. Keen Curtis was born on February 15, 1923 in Salt Lake City, 
Starting out in theater, Keane was discovered by Orson Welles, who cast him as Lennox in his 1948 motion picture Macbeth. Keane went back to the theater and spent years as a stage manager. He went back to Hollywood in 1970, playing both film and television roles. He performed numerous voiceover roles in addition to appearing in front of the camera. He appeared in 12 episodes of The Magician in 1973. He appeared in 15 episodes of Cheers. Keen Curtis died on October 13, 2002 in Utah. They show stock footage of NASA's Houston Control Facility as Captain Vico tells of a meteor shower. The science station and those aboard it were able to be saved, but Earth was bombarded by the meteor storm, the worst disaster in the history of the world, or at least since the dinosaurs, anyway. Their suspended animation experiment countdown had been showing 16 days and a few odd hours remaining, but because of the disaster code, it's now been extended. They're being vectored into an orbit to loop the sun and to return in 180 years. Meanwhile, back on Earth, hundreds of volunteers were also placed in suspended animation. Fast forward 180 years, and the countdown reaches zero. Those three astronauts are awakened. We're three minutes in, and he's still in voiceover. I've heard of an axiom among filmmakers, show, don't tell. That means to show the viewer something instead of explaining through dialogue. And I think it's about time for Strange New World to show us something. But Captain Vico tells us that they moved through the tubes to the shuttle and launched to Earth. What would we find in the strange new world? We see a craft resembling an armored vehicle driving along while the rest of the opening credits are shown. Then there's more voiceover exposition. They had survived their shuttle's crash landing. Does that mean that they're stuck here with no way back to the science station? They set out in their Vesta exploratory vehicle following a signal that fades in and out. Once again, all of this is recounted via voiceover. We cut to an interior view of that exploratory vehicle. Our three stars are there. Captain Vico is in the driver's seat. Dr. Scott is riding shotgun, and Allison is standing behind the captain, throwing all kinds of switches. There's still no dialogue at this point. Allison stops throwing switches, and she begins turning some knobs when a warning beeper goes off. We find that she has a rather pleasant voice at exactly the five-minute mark when she informs the captain that we're losing it again. There's no acknowledgement from him, just a hint of a sigh. The captain parks the Vesta and he tells her to try now. I can't get it fixed. There's something wrong with our equipment. We've been teased by that damn signal for 10 days now. But it's on our emergency recall frequency. It's got to be meant for us. The captain pulls out a big relay and he cleans one of the contacts. Allison, I think I found your radio problem. Try it again. They all stand up as if they see something coming. It's going to blow! There's a visual special effect and annoying sound used here that, if they'd done them as a group, would have been more than sufficient. It knocks each of them down, one after the other, and then the picture turns purple, first on Dr. Scott, followed by Allison, and then the captain, before repeating on all three as a group. Oh, my ears. Suddenly, they're standing side by side, dressed in form-fitting onesies 
with each of them facing a different direction. How odd. A male voice orders a blood workup on Captain Vico and an intensive fluoroscopics on all three. A female voice wants to know if they want to test for tissue age. What this film lacks in dialogue, it makes up for in visual effects. I got a few Andromeda Strain vibes from it also. It was kind of interesting, but it went on for nearly a minute and a half, which was about a minute and a half too long. The three wake up to find themselves dressed in togas. Really? Togas? What is this? I had some sort of shot. Some sort of injection. Let's see. Hmm, fairly large needle diameter. The others check their arms and yep, they've got them too. A woman enters the chamber and introduces herself as Tana. She's former Bond girl Martine Beswick. Martine Beswick was born Mary Beswick on September 26, 1941 in Jamaica. She did some modeling and entered a few beauty pageants before turning to acting. Martine was up for the role eventually played by Ursula Andress in the 1962 film Dr. No. She ended up playing two characters in two different Bond films, as Zora in her debut film From Russia with Love in 1963 and Paula in the 1965 film Thunderball. She never seemed to be without offers to appear on television, including her role as Abigail Abernathy on 18 episodes of Days of Our Lives. She has done voiceover work as recently as 2022. Martine Beswick is 82 years old. A couple of other women bring refreshments in for the captain and Allison, while Tana has Dr. Scott follow her for an explanatory meeting with the surgeon. Dr. Scott is ushered into a room where he meets the surgeon, played by James Olson. James Olson was born on October 8, 1930 in Illinois. He started performing on stage in a children's theater at the age of 12. He graduated from Northwestern University and spent a few years as an Army MP. James did some stage acting in Chicago before moving to New York. He honed his acting skills on Broadway before heading west to Hollywood. He was busy performing on the big screen as well as television until 1990. James Olson died on April 17, 2022. Funny I should have mentioned the Andromeda strain earlier, because James Olsen was the top-billed Dr. Mark Hall in that 1971 film. There you are, at last. I've waited a long time for this happy meeting. He says he's happy, but he doesn't seem happy. Meanwhile, back at the chamber where Captain Vico and Dr. Allison are resting, Tony doesn't seem to be very comfortable in his toga. You don't think this is a little out of place? Allison seems amused. The two examine a panel filled with rows of chrome toggle switches. They wonder what it does. Then Allison does what she seems to do best. She starts throwing switches. I must ask you to please keep your hands off of this panel. The lady and I are leaving. That's not possible just now. Oops! He's dead. What? Back in the surgeon's chamber, Dr. Scott is reading from a book. He finds it very impressive. Did you send the signal that brought us here? The pack signal? Yes, we did. Tana comes in and starts whispering to the surgeon. He smiles. I think he'd be upset about hearing about the death of one of his people. Your rash friend has complicated things a bit. People are frolicking around. Dr. Scott believes it to be a festival until he sees... It's all very foreboding until Sprang springs forth from his coffin. Sprang is played by Reb Brown. Robert Edward Reb Brown was born in Los Angeles on April 29, 1948. He played football in high school and received a scholarship to play at the University of Southern California. 
he was the starting running back at USC until O.J. Simpson took over his position. He worked as a Los Angeles Sheriff's deputy at one time. The six-foot-four-inch strongman is known for his muscular physique. Reb began his acting career in 1973 and was still active as recently as 2016. The surgeon calls a lovely woman over. She's Arana, played by young actress and Playboy playmate Cynthia Wood. Cynthia Wood was born in Burbank to a recording executive and an actress on September 25, 1950. In college, Cindy switched her major from music to theater, and then she dropped out in 1971. She was Playboy magazine's Playmate of the Month in February of 1973 and Playmate of the Year in 1974. She made her film debut with a brief appearance in the 1975 film Shampoo. In addition to her half-dozen roles, she has appeared on talk and variety shows. She has also worked as a casting agent, and she has earned a Ph.D. in psychology. Cynthia Wood is 74 years old. As a demonstration, the surgeon plunges a knife deep into Arana's chest, killing her. say she's dead. When we return after the break, they're being shown to an operating theater. Araba is undergoing aortic surgery while she's completely awake. The surgeon tells them that there is no death as they know it. He begins to look weak, so Tana escorts him away, and a young woman comes to answer their questions. Catherine Bachman was born on March 1, 1954 in Warren, Ohio. She is a 1970 graduate of Stevens High School in Rapid City, South Dakota. She made clothes to support herself while studying arts at UCLA. She shortened her name and appeared on the big screen beginning in 1974, and she hit television screens a year later. Catherine Bach is best known for her role as Daisy Duke on the popular television show, The Dukes of Hazard. She made some of her own outfits for that show and is known for her Daisy Duke's short shorts. Her last screen role was as Anita Lawson on the soap opera, The Young and the Restless. Catherine Bach is 70 years old. I'm not certain that I would have recognized her without her trademark Daisy Dukes, but her voice gave her away. She seems to know that Captain Vico is going to look for their Vesta. Oh, sir, what you're looking for is down below that knoll over there. It's as if she can read his thoughts. Oddly, now we can read his thoughts in the form of another voiceover as he approaches the vehicle, takes the driver's seat, and tries to drive it. It's dead, of course. That big-ass relay is missing. Back to Dr. Allison and Laura. Allison wonders where all the old folks are. Laura says that they're all around. I'm waiting for her to tell us that she's an old woman, but she doesn't. I'm certain that's where this is leading, though. We see a swing set that's overgrown with weeds. Where are the children? There are no children. What happened to them? There, there just aren't any children. There never has been. Back inside, Dr. Scott asks Araba if she knows where her replacement organ came from. My clone. Your clone? Yes. Dr. Allison comes in with the news that there are no children. Is there a need for children if they have clones? These doctors are slow on the uptake. No children. How do you reproduce? We don't. The Holocaust destroyed our reproductive capabilities. You're driving vital people, healthy and beautiful. I'd like to show you something. The surgeon shows them the incubators where the clones are grown. Allison is upset. You mean you take parts of duplicates of individuals? I think that's horrible. Captain Vico comes in and informs the doctors that the power relay is missing. 
he says that they're prisoners. He dares Dr. Scott to ask the surgeon if that's so. When he hesitates, Dr. Allison asks. We are all prisoners here in Eterna. When we rejoin the action, Tony demands an explanation. We might have even gotten one, but I couldn't tell because James Olsen was mumbling and the beeping sound effect over him was far too loud. He explains that it takes about four days to produce a clone from cellular tissue. And that is amazing. But each time the host loses some immunity to disease and infection. These newcomers have no such weakness in their blood. If they could transfuse it, it'd be like giving blood. Dr. Scott says they could give a little each month. I guess he's thinking of staying there. Surgeon starts spouting random numbers and Tana comes in and tells their guests to skedaddle. I'm afraid you'll have to leave now. Sprang? Show our guests out. It's almost supper time. Although Surgeon, from all appearances, seems to be about 40, Dr. Allison puts forth her observation that the man may be senile. That doesn't happen at 40, unless there's some sort of strange atrophy that goes on around here. I don't think that's what's happening. Meanwhile, Dr. Scott walks in on Tana spoon-feeding surgeon. Get out. Get out now. The doctor wants an explanation, and he gets one in the form of a medical diploma being shoved at him. Here, explain it to yourself. But then according to this, his age would have to be... 212 years old. If this surgeon dude is from our century, why did he choose togas as the dress code? Tony asks for Tana's help in escaping. He invites her to come with them. I won't. Even if it were possible, I wouldn't want to. She says that even if he could get the Vesta running, they won't be able to get it through the decontamination field. And if it's turned off, everyone in the compound will die. Sprang and a couple of clones come in to stop the captain. The surgeon tells Dr. Scott that he'd once attended a seminar where the good doctor had spoken. I've used many of your theoretical applications, applications of single cell growth, much more advanced. The surgeon admits his senility, and he fears that he will eventually succumb to total madness. He wants Dr. Scott to take over Eterna. He's been planning this for years, knowing that Dr. Scott was due to come back. He lured the doctor in. Please understand that it's nothing more than a simple blood extraction. When we return, Tana is bringing in a tray of medical instruments. In 15 minutes, you'll both be drinking juice and walking around, wondering why you made such a fuss. When I get loose, doctor, you'll know what the fuss is about. If it's so safe, why didn't Dr. Scott go first? You know, for a brilliant doctor, Scott isn't very bright. He takes forever to realize that his colleagues are being cloned. And mine? 
Where's mine? You're too valuable to this little corner of the universe. We couldn't risk that. The computer displays reject. The siren sounds like an old car alarm I had back in 1987. What are you doing? Just a minor alteration. It's difficult to follow what's going on, but suffice it to say, Surgeon wants Dr. Scott to drain all of the blood from Tony and Allison. Nine liters. But the adult human body only contains approximately six liters of blood. That, that can't be helped. Oh, Dr. Scott, they're your friends. You may do it. And he tells Tana to help. Dr. Scott asks her for a piece of coiled tubing. She hesitates, and then she complies, adding a sharp object along with it. I never figured you for this. Hold still. Keep your arm still. I might cut you. He cuts a strap, and Tony bolts upright. Then it's a free-for-all. The car alarm goes off again, and Surgeon throws Tana into a piece of equipment that blows up. <laughs> then, in some chain reaction, things blow up all over the place. Everybody except our three stars collapses. Outside, everybody appears to be dead there, too. There's nothing we can do for any of them now. Let's get out of here. They were last seen heading out in their togas, but they're back in those dirty outfits they'd worn at the very beginning of the show. Allison, try and set us a course. Anywhere, as long as it's peaceful this time. Captain Vico gives another voiceover, repeating the part about surviving a crash landing. Evidence that this two-hour made-for-TV movie was filmed as two separate hour-long episodes that were thrown together. We're at the halfway point now. They discuss where they might be and what direction they're going to go. They're low on food and water. I'm a little confused. The voiceover said they were in what should be the American Southwest, making me think of Arizona or New Mexico. But in the next scene, he says that they should have crossed the Mississippi yesterday. So, Tennessee? If we go due north, we'll be able to reach the lake region within a day or so. Indiana? <laughs> oh, Allison, you're a fine navigator. But you have to remember that this equipment doesn't always work properly. They can't be sure of anything. I wonder if any one of these brilliant minds thought to use the sun and the stars for navigation. How on earth did Lewis and Clark ever explore the Louisiana Territory without GPS and electronic maps? When asked for a heading, she says 235 degrees south by southwest. So, farther into the desert then. If they had put the voiceover after that dialogue, it would have made a lot more sense. They drive through some lush green foliage and some water. When they stop, the engine runs on a little bit, kind of like my old Dodge. For some reason, they dress in camo. I'll take the flare gun. If any of us get separated, I'll send up a shot like always. They're in a man-made jungle. They find some fruit, and the first thing that comes to Dr. Scott's mind is making a still. I can make us a fruit salad. And if Tony can rig us a, a still of some kind, I can spike it with guava liqueur. Hey, Tony, look! Now he wants to stay here. I've been thinking. How would you feel about staying in this place for a while? He says that they've been exploring for 10 months and they have yet to find any evidence of civilization. 
Meanwhile, Allison is venturing deeper into the jungle. She comes across a baby animal that's caught in a trap. A trap, that means there are people around. Tony and Dr. Scott hear her shout, and they go to investigate. They soon find themselves surrounded by primitives. They don't have Allison. One of them, called Hyde, sniffs out what had happened. There was um in here. Them from inside. They found her. Hyde is played by Norland Benson, who made half a dozen screen appearances, typically in minor TV roles during his brief career. We've got tools, things to trade. If you help us get her back, they got animals that eat a man. So there are caves, man made lakes, exotic animals. I'm guessing this used to be a zoo. We got this. It works. Like this. Give me the shooter, and I'll take you inside. When she's with us, and safe. The shooter is yours. We're back with the men in the next act. Tony, the doctor, and their new friend climb down a rope and set off in search of Allison. When Tony and the doc start running down a trail, that primitive man stops them. He exposes a tripwire rigged with a spiked trap. We find out that he is known as Badger, and Badger is played by Bill McKinney. William Dennison McKinney was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee on September 12, 1931. His family moved around a lot when he was growing up, so he made few friends. He joined the Navy at the age of 19 and served two years on a minesweeper off the coast of Korea. After his discharge, he settled in California and attended acting school with Dustin Hoffman. He supported himself by working as a tree trimmer until he found steady work as an actor. He hit the big screen in 1962 and he made his television debut on a 1968 episode of The Monkees. The role that defined him as a villain was as the sadistic mountain man in the 1972 film Deliverance. A heavy smoker, Bill McKinney died of esophageal cancer on December 1, 2011 at the age of 80. He played the train engineer in Back to the Future 3. Meanwhile, the cave dwellers are still prodding Allison along. One of them approaches a lion and asks it to be left past. Let us pass. Easy, old friend. Allison is being accused of poaching. It's all there in the ancient book, the Code of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Punishment is prescribed here in Section 12, as written by the Elders Commission. First offenders shall be permanently marked for identification by the letter P, to be firmly branded on the foreflank of the offender. But I tried to help the animal. It's our duty to punish poachers. We're the chosen wardens of the forest. When asked what camp she's from, Allison tries to explain that she's from the past. Cyrus withholds judgment for the time being. He wants her companions brought in. Cyrus is played by Ford Rainey, who had played Dr. Barnett on Search. Ford Rainey was born Sanford Rainey in Idaho on August 8, 1908. He had to overcome his terrible schoolboy shyness and become comfortable in front of audiences while performing in school plays. He served in the Coast Guard during World War II. He acquired his first film role in 1949. He didn't seem to land many leading roles, but he was a popular character actor for decades. 
his tall stature, and his commanding appearance, made him a shoo-in for the role of a judge or military commander. He played a president several times. He died July 25, 2005 at the age of 96. Meanwhile, Badger stops to drink from a spring. After drinking, Tony and the doc turn around to find that Badger has his bow and arrow aimed at Tony. I'll take that shooter now, Forney. When Badger smiles, I notice that his teeth are too perfect for someone in these conditions. They continue tracking. The lion attacks Badger. Tony draws it off before Badger can be mauled to death, but then he's in danger of being killed by the beast. He drops the flare gun and Badger grabs it. That man who had captured Allison shows up and he tells the lion to run. Badger shoots at him. That lion does run, and then Badger takes off. Think we can make it without him? We'll have to. Allison is having a conversation with Cyrus. The younger man comes with word of the flare gun. She's betrayed us. She's a liar. That's not true. He's Daniel, played by Jarrett, or is it Garrett Graham? Jarrett Graham was born in New York City on November 27, 1949. He grew up in Missouri, Illinois, and Michigan. His acting debut was in a stage production of Winnie the Pooh at age 8. He continued his interest in the stage in high school and Columbia University. He made his film debut in the 1968 film Greetings. In addition to acting in scores of productions in film, television, and on stage, he also wrote music and teleplays. Jared Graham is 74 years old. Cager. Later that night, Tony and the doc are still tracking. They come upon a snake habitat. That psychs out the doc. Daniel brings Alice in a cloak. Where'd her clothes go? Cyrus sent food. They have a quiet talk. Meanwhile, Tony and Scott find an old stash of animal tranquilizers. What is it? Vet supplies. You know, this whole area had to be an old zoo. Those are hypodermic darts for tranquilizing animals. They need a way of delivering the tranquilizer, so they pull apart an old arcade machine to build something, and they soon have themselves a crossbow. Now let's see if it works. Back with Cyrus and his people, he's now seeking the death penalty for Allison. There are many such cases, and in all of them, the commission has pronounced the punishment of death. Daniel disagrees. Cyrus, I won't follow the articles. As to the method of killing? In the idea of killing. Killing this woman because we think she's betrayed us. There's been no attack. But it was your word that condemned her. As he's leaving, Tony tranquilizes him. When we rejoin the action, a group of executioners, wearing black shrouds over their heads, is being led by Cyrus to get Allison from that cage. 
When she sees snakes in a pit, she screams. Let her go! Let her go! And we'll let him go! After the prisoner exchange, Cyrus guarantees them safe passage out of the forest. That's all well and good, but they'll have to get past Badger and his group. Tony, come here, quick! Recognize our friend? What is it? He's got the flare gun. Tony sends the escorts back to warn the others. We still can make the Vesta and be safe. What defense have they got against our flare gun? They'll kill each other. Just how many flares does that thing have? Tony's down to his last tranquilizer dart. Then we really have only one chance. I gotta be so close I can't miss. Badger and his group enter the zoo compound. When someone calls his name, he turns and he fires. Then Daniel shows himself. Badger holds his fire for some reason, but he advances and holds the flare gun at Daniel's face. Badger finds it amusing. Try it again, Forty. But eventually the tranquilizer does start to take effect. and the invaders are taken prisoner. Daniel has learned from Allison. I have learned from you. Thank you. He's determined to change the laws so that they can all live in peace. They say their goodbyes and the three depart. I had read somewhere that this film was far more serious and less campy than the predecessors. For what it's worth, I enjoyed the second story much more than the first. On its own, I think I could have gotten into a series based on the second half. I'm not convinced that I wouldn't have switched channels before that, though. I was disappointed that the Dr. Scott character was always so quick to consider settling down and abandoning their mission. I kind of expected them to go and revive the Pax people. Maybe that would have come later on. I guess the main plot here was that they'd always be trying to find those suspended animation chambers. Kind of like Star Lost was always searching for the backup bridge. I also expected these doctors and scientists to be a little more intelligent than they seem to be especially when I can guess what's happening long before they do. What do you think? Would you have tuned in to this on a weekly basis based on this pilot? I'm told that the next logical step on this journey is the 1974 Gene Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn film, Questor Tapes. Maybe being engrossed with that project might explain why Roddenberry was absent from Strange New World. Who knows? Maybe he was paid for the story ideas too. I have a copy of Questor Tapes on order. In the meantime, I may take another look at Earth 2, a 1971 movie that I haven't seen in quite a while. Remember to like, subscribe, and comment. Activate the notification bell so you'll know when to join me again on my next Old Joe's Reminiscence. The ABC Sunday Night Movie.